Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us, either here in person at the library or from home on Zoom. A couple of reminders before we begin tonight's program. First, for those joining us in the building, please remember that per, t per town guidelines, we ask that you keep your masks on while inside the library. And please do remember to silence your cell phones while the program is in progress. I know that's not necessary for those of you at home, but for those of you here, that's a huge help. So for those of you who don't know, Lewis Grossman is a graduate of Burr Farms Elementary School, Long Lots Junior High School, and Staples High School. So he is Westport through and through. He is a professor of law and affiliate professor of history at American University. He has also been a Law and Public Affairs Fellow at Princeton University and a visiting professor at Cornell Law School. He teaches and writes in the areas of food and drug law, health law, American legal history, and civil procedure. He has been, he has written for several academic journals and published volumes and is the co-author of Food and Drug Law, Cases and Materials, and a documentary companion to a civil action, both widely used texts. On top of all of that, he has served on four committees of the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Whew. Professor Grossman earned his PhD in history from Yale, where he was awarded the George Washington Eggleston Prize for best dissertation. He received a JD from Harvard Law School and a BA from Yale University. Tonight, we're going to discuss, or he's going to discuss, Choose Your Medicine, which is out now and available for purchase this evening if you haven't already purchased it. And for those of you at home, if at any time you have a question for Professor Grossman, please just type it into the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, I'm going to get off the stage. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, let me start by saying that although I did the calculation in my head and I've now lived in other places not Westport for three times longer than I lived in Westport, I really do feel like I'm coming home and doing my book launch at the most important location in my life. So it's really uh, a delight to be here. Um, so this is, uh, a woman named Abigail Burroughs. Uh, on January 1st, 2000, at the dawn of the new millennium, 19-year-old Abigail had many reasons to celebrate. She had just completed a successful first semester at the University of Virginia, uh, of her second year at the University of Virginia. She was earning excellent grades. She had a devoted group of friends. The main annoyance that Abigail confronted that fall was an irksome mouth sore that would not heal. But even that problem was now gone. Her doctor had removed the sore in December. Then a few years into the new year, Abigail's world began to crumble. Biopsy results showed that her sore was a squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. She underwent an additional procedure to remove the margins of the lesion and then returned to UVA and forged on with her college career. But that summer, she discovered a lump in her neck. The cancer had returned and invaded her lymph nodes, and things went downhill from there. Abigail underwent a couple of unsuccessful rounds of chemotherapy. But finally, in 2001, Abigail's oncologist at Johns Hopkins University informed her that her only remaining recourse was to try an experimental treatment not yet approved by the FDA. The most promising investigational drug was called C225, which was made by in Imclone. The company had completed a successful phase one clinical study on the drug in patients with head and neck cancer, and this study suggested that C225 may have shrunk the subject's tumors. 
Now, during phase one, which is the first of the three phases that lead to FDA drug approval, a new drug is tested without placebo or other controls in a small number of patients, mainly to determine if it is safe enough to proceed with other trials, but also to gain early evidence on effectiveness if possible. But a drug's effectiveness can only be meaningfully established by the larger controlled studies conducted in phases two and three. Unfortunately, Abigail did not qualify for any of the ongoing clinical trials of C225. She thus attempted to obtain it through an FDA procedure known as compassionate use, which permitted companies to provide unapproved drugs to desperately ill individuals. But drug sponsors were not required to participate in this procedure, and they were generally hesitant to do so when asked. One big reason for this hesitance was that FDA prohibits companies from profiting off the sale of compassionate use drugs and often forbids them from selling them at all. Thus, unsurprisingly, Imclone refused to provide Abigail with compassionate access to C225. The company explained it had only limited supplies of the drug and could not choose amongst the hundreds of people who were requesting it. It also didn't want to sap resources away from the controlled clinical trials that it was conducting to gain FDA approval. The company's CEO declared, we think truly the most compassionate thing to do for the oncology community is to get this drug approved. Despite a massive public relations campaign launched by her father and the rest of her family, Abigail never got to try C225, and she tragically died at her home in Falls Church, Virginia, on June 9, 2001. Five years later, FDA approved C225 under the brand name Herbitox for the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Soon after Abigail's death, her father founded a nonprofit organization called Abigail Alliance. And I want to say that I've gotten to know uh, Frank Burroughs over the course of writing this book, and he provided me with this photo. In 2003, the organization filed suit against the FDA in federal court in Washington, D.C. It sought an, an injunction prohibiting the agency from barring sales of post-phase one drugs to patients in desperate situations like Abigail's. It based its claim on the theory of substantive due process that was used in Roe v. Wade in 1973. In 2006, Abigail Alliance achieved a stunning victory in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. In a two-to-one decision, liberal judge Judith Rogers and conservative judge Douglas Ginsburg ruled that mentally competent, terminally ill patients with no alternatives have a fundamental right to obtain potentially life-saving medications after successful phase one testing. The court used a test for substantive due process, asking whether an asserted right is objectively deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Judge Rogers examined the history of drug regulation in America and concluded that a right of control over one's body and of preserving one's own life has deep roots in the common law and in American law. Unfortunately for the Alliance, the 13 judges of the DC Circuit vacated this decision and reheard the case as a full court. It turns out that Abigail Alliance had drawn an inside straight in the assignment of the three judges for the panel. And when the full court uh, voted, the court issued an 11-2 decision in favor of the FDA with only Rogers and Ginsburg dissenting. Judge Thomas Griffith, who wrote for the majority, read the historical record very differently from Judge Rogers. He pointed to a history of state and federal regulation extending back to the country's earliest years, and he said, quote, we conclude that our nation 
has long expressed interest in drug regulation. Therefore, the alliance's claimed right is not fundamental. I want to ask the people in the room the question that I ask my students every year, which is, do you think that Abigail had a fundamental right to try this drug um, at, after phase one? How many of you think that she had a fundamental right to try it? So just so for people uh, in uh, the cybersphere, um, the vast majority of people sitting in the room just raised their hands. And for years, my students have agreed with you, often by overwhelming margins. I want to let you have a chance to revote after pointing out something. If drug companies could sell unapproved drugs for a profit after phase one, they might never perform the phase two and phase three trials necessary to determine whether the drugs are safe and effective. I just wanted to point that out and ask, does it change anyone's vote? Let's vote again. How many of you still think that Abigail has a fundamental right to try the drug? Once again, a vast majority of the people in the room voted that she does have this right. <laughs> I've taught this case for years, and I've always been fascinated by the discussion, by the vote, and by the almost unanimous response of students who, by the way, consider themselves over, overwhelmingly liberal that, um, that Abigail does have such a right. But when I first read Abigail Alliance, I was drawn to it not only as a teacher of food and drug law, but also as a historian. Judges Rogers and Griff have painted very different portraits of the evolution of American views on drug regulation, and I wondered whose picture was more accurate. I thus started researching this history myself. I didn't focus exclusively or even primarily on formal legal materials like cases and statutes. I also looked at petitions, speeches, popular magazine articles, legislative testimony, and slogans chanted at street demonstrations. Moreover, I didn't focus exclusively on drug regulation but I also considered other forms of medical regulation that restrict patient choice. Most importantly, the licensing of medical practitioners. Based on this research, I reached the following conclusions. First, throughout American history, a broad swath of the population has believed that people have a right to choose their preferred medical treatments without government interference. This goes all the way back to the father of American medicine, Benjamin Rush, a, Pen a University of Pennsylvania medical school professor, signer of the Declaration of Independence, very important founding father, who is considered the father of American medicine. Um, and even though he stood for orthodox medicine in many people's minds, he vigorously opposed medical licensing, restrictions on treatments, and compelled treatments. Indeed, a legend developed over the course of American history that Benjamin Rush had supported the addition of a medical rights amendment to the US Constitution. And this has taken on uh, the uh, sort of like a status of truth on the internet. Go home tonight and look up Benjamin Rush, medical freedom, and you will find page after page after page declaring as fact that he supported a medical freedom amendment to the Constitution. Not true, but he did set forth many of the principles of medical freedom that would continue throughout US history. My second realization from this research is that this widespread preference for freedom of therapeutic choice has often been reflected in American law and policy from the country's earliest years. So, since we're in Connecticut, let me illustrate with a couple of nutmeg state stories. Let's start with 1787. In 1787, the Connecticut legislature debated a bill that would have established a state medical society with licensing power. It turned out to be an incredibly controversial proposal. One representative protested that he, quote, did not like this plan. 
It was a combination of the doctors. They cost more than they do good. This medical society was directly against liberty. It was a very dangerous thing. And the legislature rejected the bill. Let's go forward 100 years to 1893. The Connecticut House of Representatives held a public hearing on a bill that would have established a mandatory examination for all practitioners seeking medical licenses. An organization called the National Constitutional Liberty League disseminated, disseminated a circular throughout the state urging, quote, those who would maintain their constitutional liberty of choice of physician or healer to personally appear to signify their determination to defend this inherent and inalienable right. Opponents of the bill flooded the hearing. A reporter observed that, quote, Christian scientists were there and those of the faith cure school and the auditors of the gentle sex were very audible in their applause. Reflecting, by the way, the fact that women have always played a very central role in the movements I talk about in the book. Um, after the hearing, thousands of Connecticut citizens signed petitions opposing the licensing bill. And in the face of such antagonism, supporters of the measure accepted major amendments to enable its passage. As finally enacted in 1893, the Connecticut medical licensing law explicitly stated that it did not apply to, quote, any chiropodist or clairvoyant, nor to any person practicing the massage method or Swedish movement cure, sun cure, mind cure, magnetic healing, or Christian science, nor to any other person who does not use or prescribe in his treatment of mankind drugs, poisons, medicine, chemicals, or nostrums. As reflected by these stories, my research also revealed that for most of American history, bodily autonomy, which was the basis for the Abigail Alliance decision, at least of the dissenters, was only one of multiple strains of freedom rhetoric that featured prominently in therapeutic choice advocacy. The others included freedom of conscience and religion. The ideal of med medical choice has always been inextricably intertwined with the free exercise of religion in America. Economic freedom, in particular opposition to state-supported medical monopolies. And freedom of, in sorry, freedom of inquiry, the notion that widespread unregulated use of treatments is the best way to advance medical knowledge. As you may have already realized, during the COVID-19 pandemic, all of these traditional tropes have pervaded the language of vaccine resistors and hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin advocates. While doing my research, I was also struck by the explicitly constitutional nature of many arguments for freedom of therapeutic choice, even those presented outside of court. This was also evident in the Connecticut quotations. With some important exceptions, American courts have only rarely ruled in favor of medical choice. But American medical freedom advocacy epitomizes something called popular constitutionalism, the creation of constitutional law by the people rather than by judges. Americans have historically demanded and won freedom of therapeutic choice in extrajudicial forums. These include rallies, petition drives, elections, referenda, legislative and regulatory hearings, and jury service. Now let me add that from the perspective of popular constitutionalism, the Constitution is not limited to the US Constitution's detailed provisions. It also includes the broad foundational principles of equality, liberty, and self-governance set forth in the preamble to the Constitution and in the Declaration of Independence. Throughout my book, medical freedom advocates constantly invoke the Declaration's inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and indeed sometimes mistakenly treat it as a constitutional provision. 
Still another theme that emerged from my research was the unusual politics around freedom of therapeutic choice. Judge Rogers and Judge Ginsburg's liberal conservative alliance in Abigail Alliance is representative of a broader phenomenon. American medical freedom advocacy has long defied and bridged conventional political categories. Consider the following strange bedfellows. Pat Buchanan and gay activists on access to unapproved AIDS drugs. John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi on dietary supplement deregulation. Tom DeLay and Bernie Sanders on federal deregulation of alternative medical practice. Newt Gingrich and Barney Frank on medical marijuana legalization. And finally, the entire American right wing and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on vaccine resistance and access to alternative remedies during COVID-19. I'm not gonna summarize the whole book, which covers the topic from the revolution to the present. So for brevity's sake, let me skip to the 1970s. Um, the 1970s were a key decade, not only because Louis Grossman spent them in Westport, Connecticut, um, but it's also a decade when broad swaths of society embraced the cause of therapeutic choice. In the book, I examine this phenomenon as embodied in health food activism, including activism over uh, um, vitamin pills. I pay a lot of attention to the women's health movement, which included most obviously reproductive rights and the decision of Roe v. Wade in 1973, but also the proliferation of women's health centers around the country and women's embrace of alter alternative remedies. I spend a long time looking at the, uh, the astonishingly powerful social movement in favor of the alternative cancer drug Laetril derived from apricot pits. How many of you remember Laetril? So a bunch of you do. It turns out that it was a huge story, particularly in 1977. One of the biggest stories in America. So big that Gary Trudeau uh, wrote a strip, a series of strips on it. Here you have Duke getting into the apricot farming business. Um, uh, it was on the cover of Newsweek. Um, and ultimately, something like 70% of Americans supported legalization of Laetril. Uh, state after state passed Laetril legalization laws, and uh, legislation was introduced in Congress to legalize Laetril or even to take away FDA's regulatory authority over drugs. The surge in the use of alternative and complementary medicine in the 1970s has never subsided, and I explore the various ways through today that American law has accommodated rather than quashed this trend. In the 1980s, I examined the epic struggle by AIDS activist groups to persuade the FDA and Congress to permit early access to unapproved AIDS drugs and speed their approval. Over the course of writing this book, I got to uh, talk to personally a, a bunch of the AIDS activists from the 1980s, uh, most of whom are miraculously uh, still alive and healthy and doing well. Um, I show how the AIDS movement had remarkable success in reforming federal regulations and federal statutes. The signal moment in this movement was the 1988 uh, takeover, quote unquote, of the FDA. Um, and indeed, this is Peter Staley having uh, scaled the front of the FDA building and celebrating who I describe in the book and uh, he sent me this, uh, this actual photo. And as you can see um, from uh, photos of the demonstration. Uh, look what that sign says. It says, why has the FDA denied Americans with AIDS their freedom of choice? Um, so these reforms that the FDA, sorry, that the AIDS activists um, uh, helped initiate have sped the approval of drugs, they have allowed drug approval based on less evidence of efficacy, and they've made drugs more available to desperately ill patients prior to approval. 
The event I talk most about in the 1990s um, is the start of the stunningly successful medical marijuana legalization movement. Um, with the passage of California Proposition 215 in 1996, um, it, it started a, a series of dominoes uh, that have led ultimately to 35 states now having legalized medical marijuana, mostly through referenda and initiatives, um, votes taken directly by the people. Um, these are conservative states and liberal states, and today the most challenging thing for the medical marijuana people is not the anti-marijuana um, extremists, but rather the uh, recreational marijuana people who are kind of taking away their special market by uh, advancing successfully legalization of recreational marijuana around the country. When I get to the 2000s and 2000s, and, well, here's another picture of, of uh, marijuana activists. When I get to the 2000s and 2010s, I have a chapter called The Freedom to be Covered, which addresses the relationship between demands for freedom of therapeutic choice and health insurance. Since the turn of this century, we've seen the paradoxical assertion, especially by conservatives, of a right to therapeutic choice in the context of reimbursed health care, even government reimbursed health care. Every hint of a limitation on insurance coverage provokes cries like rationing and death panel, and even this, keep the government's hands off my Medicare. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I explore this in, in various respects and explore, explore the paradox of conservatives taking this position. Finally, at the end of the book, um, I talk about physician-assisted suicide. You may recognize this visage, it's uh, Jack Kervorkian. Um, this final chapter considers why it is that Americans remain more ambivalent about physician-assisted suicide than the other treatments and products discussed in this book, where freedom of therapeutic choice seems to have prevailed. Um, the progress of physician-assisted suicide is slow in this country. About 10 states have now legalized it, and there is um, a interesting alliance that resists it. Religious objectors join with disability rights activists and people from minority groups in this country uh, to overwhelmingly, well, not overwhelmingly, but to defeat uh, um, efforts to legalize uh, physician-assisted suicide in state after state. I'd like to end by discussing America's response to COVID-19. I started writing this book well before the emergence of COVID-19, but the pandemic has offered a treasure trove of material and a spate of last-minute additions. I think the last one went in in June uh, to the despair of my publisher. Oh, so I, I, I lost track of my slides. Here are some slides of, of uh, people using the choice rhetoric in connection with uh, physician-assisted suicide. But these are people using the very same choice rhetoric in connection with COVID-19. Protests around the country. No masks, no vaxes, freedom of choice. My body, my risk, my choice. Many of you probably believe that the current deluge of anti-scientific, anti-establishment, and conspiratorial rhetoric around COVID-19 demonstrates that America has gone off the rails. From a historical perspective, however, I would argue that the country has simply returned to its customary state of mind. Throughout most of our history, a wide swath of Americans has not only demanded freedom of therapeutic choice, but has done so in large part because they harbored deep, even conspiratorial suspicions about the medical establishment uh, and scientists and experts and elites and big business and the government and bureaucrats. It is easy to overlook the deep roots of these attitudes because we emerged relatively recently from an atypical era, the middle of the 20th century, in which Americans overwhelmingly trusted and even celebrated the country's experts, 
and establishment institutions. This is Jonas Salk, the developer of the first polio vaccine. Following the 1955 introduction of this vaccine, Salk regularly ranked as one of the most admired men in America. According to my very unscientific research, he was roughly as popular as Mickey Mantle, the baseball player, or James Dean, the movie star. And he was a scientist, a nerdy scientist. Americans by the millions rolled up their children's sleeves even before approval because there was a massive clinical trial of the polio vaccine uh, prior to its rollout. Even Elvis Presley took the polio vaccine for the cameras. As recently as the mid-1960s, 73% of Americans, 73%, reported that they had great confidence in the leaders of medicine, and 76% stated that they trusted the federal government to do what is right most of the time. Even during the mid-20th century, however, a vociferous minority struggled against the orthodox medical establishment's supposedly repressive policies. The years after World War II, saw the emergence of a paranoid, ultra-conservative strain of medical freedom activism that has been with us ever since. Consider, for example, the right-wing Baptist minister and radio personality, Gerald Winrod, from Kansas, nicknamed the Jayhawk Nazi. When FDA banned a popular, unproved cancer remedy called the Hoxie Cure in the 1950s, Winrod contended that the federal government, dominated by communists and Jews, had a master plan to dominate the lives of the people by means of a health dictatorship. He claimed to be speaking on behalf of good and loyal Americans in defense of medical choice and the quote unquote Christian program. Nonetheless, trust in establishment institutions was rampant in the mid 20th century and people like Winrod had little effect on policy. But in the 1970s, the nation's faith in major institutions plummeted in reaction to the Vietnam War, Watergate, the oil crisis, and stagflation. By the end of the 1970s, Americans' confidence in the country's government and establishment institutions had dropped dramatically. Trust in scientific and medical institutions took a major hit. Think about the path from uh, the Manhattan Project to Three Mile Island in the 1970s. In 1976, doubts about the medical establishment in particular surged across the political spectrum in response to a disastrous aborted federal effort to vaccinate the entire population against swine flu. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Biden rolled up his sleeve and took his booster shot. He was not the first president to do that. But this rollout was an utter disaster um, as the swine flu that they were waiting for never really came and uh, a number of people died or were sickened by a predictable side effect called Guillain-Barre syndrome. During the 1970s, medical libertarianism became an increasingly bipartisan cause as countercultural hippies and feminists joined fundamental, fundamentalist Christians in resisting Orthodox medicine's authority. And these attitudes bled in from both sides towards the middle. Americans' former confidence in establishment institutions in general, and the medical establishment in particular, has never recovered. In 2018, which was before the pandemic, only 37% of Americans reported having great confidence in the leaders of American medicine, and only 11% reported having such confidence in the executive branch of government. It's no surprise that so many people distrust the alliance between them. One might have predicted that the astounding development of three effective COVID vaccines in less than a year, a medical miracle, would have boosted popular confidence in the medical corporate government complex from which they emerged. But this stupendous achievement has had no such effect on the millions of Americans 
who refuse to be immunized and instead place their trust in God and in alternative remedies. But let me repeat, this is not new. Although we lack polling data from before World War II, the historical record demonstrates that throughout the country's first 170 years, disdain for the orthodox medical establishment and for medical re regulation was rampant, and activism in favor of medical freedom was commonplace. An extremely enduring theme in American history has been the corrupt control of the government by selfish interest groups such as the American Medical Association and pharmaceutical companies to thwart competitors and profit off American bodies. Because of the restoration of America's traditional culture of distrust, our response to COVID-19 has been shaped by political ideology as much as by science. Moreover, current attitudes towards medical policy correlate with party identity in a way that recalls the 19th century. Now, as then, Americans are acquiring much of their information, including health information, from blatantly partisan sources. In light of this, we are unlikely anytime soon to return to the relatively halcyon days of the mid 20th century, when medical researchers were heroes, government health officials were trusted public servants, and science was objective fact. And I leave you with this image, which is a woman named Simone Gold from California, who is a conservative physician activist, who the day of the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol started the morning at a health freedom rally uh, near the Capitol, and then when the crowd surged into the Capitol, went into the Capitol, pulled out a bullhorn, and started spouting American, sorry, spouting medical freedom rhetoric to the gathered crowds. This is where we are now, and we should expect to be there, I think, for a long time. Thank you very much. Everybody, I'm back. Um, if anybody from in the building has a question for a professor, you can um, just come up to the microphone and ask the question. Does anybody here have one before? Come on up. You can keep your mask on, please. Great lecture, thank you. Uh, given that the medical profession starts from the position do no harm, is there another country out there that has a roadmap that maybe Americans could look at to uh, encourage them to maybe listen to their medical advisors? So, so your question is whether by looking at another country, we could convince Americans to trust their doctors more? Not to uh, say convince, but to have a, a, an example of somebody who's done it in a, a better way. I mean, I think if we look at COVID-19 and we look at countries that have done it more successfully than we, um, Australia, for example, um, you can broadcast stories about that all the time on the American media, but for that portion of the American public who so deeply distrusts the medical establishment, I don't know that it will have any effect. Um, you know, Americans are perhaps less inclined to model themselves on people in other countries than any people on earth. Um, and so I don't find a lot of hope in that, in that program. We have a question from the home audience right now. Um, given that you started writing this book before the pandemic, can you talk about your writing process and how your assumptions and your research changed as the pandemic went on and or did it change as you were writing this book? So there had already been a lot of good stuff written on the history of vaccination and anti-vaccination. So when I started writing this book, my main goal was to focus on the parallel uh, phenomenon of people um, demanding access to uh, drugs and doctors that they wanted as opposed to resisting compelled treatment. Um, now, the anti-vaccination movement uh, has always been very closely aligned, both philosophically and organizationally, with uh, the movements I talk about in this book. But 
as I look at it now, if I were writing it from scratch in 2021, I probably would have spoken more about anti-vaccinationism and resistance to compelled medicine uh, than I do, even though it had already been um, well covered. So in, in terms of the content of the book, I think that that's the biggest uh, impact. Uh, in terms of the themes of the book, um, I feel vindicated. Um, I feel like um, I had identified a strain of American thought, um, and to my horror, um, uh, I'm seeing it play out uh, in America today. Um, I will say that there's, I was reading the, the book last night, um, there's even a statement that suggests that when it comes to communicable diseases, Americans are different because they understand that it's not just their freedom at stake, it's also the health of other people around them. Uh, and I would probably rewrite that sentence today, at least acknowledging that there's a very broad group of Americans for whom that doesn't matter, for whom altruism is completely trumped by individualism and selfishness. Okay, we have another question from the at-home audience. Um, did you, did, whoop, hold on a second. Um, can you discuss any fraud in unapproved or unproven remedies and drugs? And would you comment on that? Yeah, so um, I just want to make clear that uh, I'm not an advocate for fraudulent medicines. Uh, in fact, I'm not even an advocate for freedom of choice rhetoric generally. I approach this as a historian. But here's where America has come down on that for the most part, um, at least the majority of Americans. Even as Americans have uh, generally embraced the notion that people um, have a right to access uh, medicines uh, that um, they think might help them. There's also a relatively uh, broad consensus that people are not allowed to put fraudulent claims uh, on their products, uh, be it um, you know devices or drugs. Now, obviously out there in the, uh, you know, it, it, in the information environment, there's all kinds of understandings that things work um, uh, when uh, they don't. But, um, but the, the law is still pretty firmly against uh, fraud. And I do examine uh, a number of different instances in American history when the US government has successfully fought against fraud. But when you come to uh, an episode like Laetrile, um, recognize that the purveyors of Laetrile didn't have to make fraudulent claims uh, because sometimes the fraudulent understanding of what a drug does is so uh, um, immersive in American society that labeling claims aren't even necessary, advertising claims aren't even necessary. Um, and in that instance, um, there's very little that the law can do about it. So how do you feel that Greg Abbott in Texas can say the two things that don't seem to make any sense? One, that he is going to ban the vaccine mandates, but also he's one of the proponents of the anti-abortion laws that are going on. It doesn't make any sense to say I'm going to, you have freedom of therapeutic choice, in one sense, but not in the other sense. How can he say both things and believe both things? So I don't have any special insight into this, but I think that what he would say, and it sounds trite, is that there's a huge difference there because what's at stake in that case is another life. Um, now you may say, well, it, what's it, there are other lives at stake as well when you're, when you're resisting vaccine mandates, um, but there is at least some level of uncertainty as to who you will make sick and how many you will make sick. And an abortion, and again, this is not a position I'm embracing, but an abortion inevitably ends the life of, of people that Greg Abbott would say are people. Um, so is there inconsistency? Of course there's inconsistency. Um, but you know, if, if you have any hope that you're ever gonna convince Greg Abbott that because he believes in medical freedom in every other aspect of his philosophy, that he should also be in favor of medical freedom 
when it comes to women's right to choose, don't hold your breath, it's not gonna happen. There was this, this moment in the 1970s when it looked like Roe v. Wade would be spun out into a more general medical freedom opinion. It was used in an early medical marijuana case to defend the, the right to access medical marijuana. It was used in some early laetrile cases that were later overruled to support the right to access laetrile. And there was this brief moment when it looked like Roe v. Wade would become a medical freedom opinion, not just a, uh, a, a right to choose opinion. Um, but that ended, and you know, it's an, another interesting question to ask is, well, why is it that when um, we get to the full panel in Abigail Alliance, we had an interesting alliance of liberals and conservatives, um, uh, one liberal and one conservative voting in favor of Abigail Alliance, but we also have an interesting alliance of liberals and conservatives voting in that group of 11 who voted against Abigail Alliance. And I think that both conservatives and liberals had a reason to not want to support uh, that decision. For liberals, liberals generally support um, health regulation and regulation of medical uh, products and so forth, and they didn't want to uh, disable the, uh, the government from being able to perform that kind of regulation. From the conservative side, the decision was based on Roe v. Wade reasoning. And conservatives have always hated Roe v. Wade. And they've always hated it not just because of the precise result in Roe v. Wade, uh, legalizing abortion, but because of the nature of the legal reasoning, which is identifying unenumerated rights in the Constitution and expanding them into some generalized right to privacy and right to do this and right to do that. Um, and uh, I think that that is ultimately what convinced this alliance of conservatives and liberals to, to vote the way they did. I know I've come a long way from your question, but Roe v. Wade just got me thinking. Fabulous, anyone else in the building? Oh, we, come on up. While you're coming up, I'll just ask, um, did you come away from finishing this book feeling positive about where the country might be moving toward? And is there some small silver lining in all of this? So I don't view uh, the apotheosis of freedom of medical choice as an unmitigated disaster. Um, let's start with women's freedom of, of choice. Um, I wholly support that and to the degree that's a, a, a medical um, as well as a reproductive and, and women's rights issue. Um, I think that that's uh, a really good development in America. Um, I think that to the degree that the AIDS activists have actually reformed the FDA review process in a way that truly does make drugs available more quickly and unapproved drugs available more broadly to desperately ill people, I think I support that. Sometimes there are stories that come into the news that suggest that FDA has gone too far in the other direction, but I don't view that as bad. I view it as good. Um, I view, in general, the fact that um, Americans have not only become incredibly informed and passionate about their medical rights, but have actually got, uh, gotten involved in the formation of medical policy through patient advocacy and so forth, in general a good thing. And so I don't mean to cast this, uh, this dark light on, on my story. And I don't think if you read the book, you come away with tears in your eyes. Uh, it just so happens that my time of writing the book ended with COVID-19, where I thought that, you know, medical freedom might have reached its limits. Um, and it didn't, um, and that is a sad story. Medical insurance companies are a fairly recent occurrence in our history. In 1960s, we have pediatricians coming to our children's home and providing care. Now, we find ourselves having no choice over which insurance we can choose, whatever our job 
provides. And they charge whatever they charge, and we have very little say in what we would like to choose. Whatever they cover, we all know that they don't like to cover brand names. They force us to take generic names. So I'm wondering, is there any regulations or anything that you can comment on? Thank you. So that is uh, an irony in all of this, is that despite all of the advocacy for medical freedom of choice, and when you look at the law, in many cases, successful advocacy, most Americans don't have unfettered freedom of medical choice. Um, as you said, they don't have the choice in many instances of, of what plan they're going to get. And when they get the plan, the plan virtually never allows them unfettered choice of doctor and unfettered choice of, uh, of drugs. Um, I write a lot about the rise of the formulary system in this book uh, and the way that um, it basically turns into a restriction on choice. And now in a typical healthcare plan, um, you're not allowed to choose whatever drug you want. Uh, there may be uh, limitations on the drugs on the formulary. There may be requirements that you try one drug before you try another drug. And also think back to Obama and think back to Clinton. And this actually goes back to Johnson and Truman. Every single president who has advanced major health reform initiatives has said to the American people, don't worry, I promise you can choose your doctor. You can keep your doctor. It's like the third rail, but it's not true. Um, at least not true. I don't want to comment on you know, the, the intricacies of the Affordable Care Act. But most Americans don't get to choose their doctor, and most Americans don't necessarily get to keep their doctor if they like their doctor, if they change jobs or change locations. So you are absolutely right that any notion in the abstract of freedom of choice uh, in this country is a chimera to some extent, um, because we don't actually have that choice if we don't have the resources to just pay for whatever we want. Great, thank you so much. If there are no more questions from the in-house audience, I'm going to thank you, Lewis, for coming and telling us so much about all of this. I'd like to thank you all for coming, both in-house and at home. And remember, there are copies of the book if you'd like to purchase it tonight. Thank you so much. And remember to keep watching Westport library.org for recordings of these events and upcoming events. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening.